This show is about your mental health. While it's supported by the pillars of positivity and hope, if you find yourself in crisis, please reach out for help. In many communities in both the United States and Canada, you can dial 211 to be connected to mental health and crisis services in your region. While it may seem like it at times, you are not alone. Last episode on the Happy Molecule, Dr. Chris Palmer from Harvard Medical School and the McLean Hospital for Mental Health on what you eat and how it has a direct impact on your mental health. We have an epidemic of obesity. We have another epidemic of prediabetes and diabetes. And oh, by the way, coincidentally, we also have another epidemic called mental health diagnoses. And, um, and they range, the whole range of the mental health spectrum is getting worse over the exact same time span that we have been seeing these epidemics of obesity and diabetes worsen. And what do I mean by that? I mean, depression is now the leading cause of disability um, in the world. Uh, but I mean, the rates of bipolar disorder have gone up among children and adolescents, they've gone up astronomically. Uh, the rates of autism have gone up. And most people don't think any of those things have anything to do with each other. Like those are different diagnoses with very different symptoms. They affect different types of people. And that, those things don't have anything to do with diet. But in fact, there's a lot of cutting edge research right now showing that dietary interventions can actually have an impact on all of those diagnoses that I just mentioned. So what you should eat, and for that matter, not eat. The conclusion to my chat with Dr. Chris Palmer right now on The Happy Molecule. Okay, let's do, let's do a BuzzFeed uh, headline here. The following five foods will help your mood. It's a really good question, and, and I'm going to be such a downer with my <laughs> answer. I actually don't think the following five foods will help anyone's mood. And I know that there are people out there and I have colleagues that I really like a lot who will say things like that. If you're depressed, eat salmon, eat blueberries. That'll cheer you up. I don't say that. Um, so a ketogenic diet is not five foods. A ketogenic diet is about changing your metabolism as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And that means here are foods, here are a whole variety of foods that you are going to eat, but here are also, a, here's a whole list of foods you're not going to eat, and you're going to achieve these objective metrics. You're going to achieve ketosis, which is measurable. It's a lab test or a blood prick or a breath or a urine test that you can do. And so I'm trying to change your biology and eat these five foods and you're gonna get a miracle cure. I, I, I actually really um, have strong opinions <laughs> against that because I feel like it, it, it frustrates people. It's giving them misinformation. It's giving them really naive and simplistic information that it's only going to serve to further shame, humiliate, like, like people with mental illnesses. So Dr. Palmer said, if I eat these five foods, I should feel better, <laughs> yet I don't feel better. So does that mean I have treatment resistant illness or does that mean Dr. Palmer's a quack? Like, what does that mean? And, um, and I, I would say it, it, if, if that's what I said, it would mean I'm a quack. It, it doesn't mean that you have treatment resistant illness or that there isn't an answer for your illness. It just means that that's the way it is. By no means, let me be clear, by no means do I think dietary interventions will help every suffering soul on the planet. If you are a woman in an abusive relationship and your husband is beating you up intermittently and, and tormenting you psychologically every day, Changing your diet is not the solution for you. <laughs> yeah. Let me be clear. First and foremost, you need to get out of that dangerous relationship. You need to feel safe. You need to feel respected. But safe is the operative word. 
people are not going to feel not depressed or not traumatized if they don't feel safe. Now, if if we get that woman, if that woman also happens to have type 2 diabetes and also happens to have chronic depression, my number one strategy with her is we have to get you out of that relationship. We have to get you into a safe place. The second goal, I have to get you psychologically to be okay with being on your own. You can't go running back to him. You can't go finding another man who's going to abuse you in the same way. Like you need self-esteem. You need self-respect. You need to know in your core that nobody can get away with treating you that way, that you don't deserve that. You'll, you're never going to put up with that again. Now, if I get her through those two steps, and she still says, okay, I'm, I've, got, I've done those two things, but I'm still depressed and I'm still diabetic and I'm still overweight. Then I might start talking with her about a diet and, and I might start saying, okay, now let's do a dietary intervention, see if we can really fully address all of your symptoms and all of the physiology and the, and the biology that's happening in it for you. Our mood gets caught in a downward spiral, though. And, and so we were depressed and we feel like we want to eat and we eat crap. And then we get, obviously, we're feeding that depression unknowingly. Well, then we don't feel like eating better. And then we feel worse. Then we don't feel like eating better. And it, and it just keeps going on and on and on. Is there an effective way to try and break that cycle? There is, and I think it's really insightful that you say that. Most people kind of know that. Really fascinating thing, just in the last week, a research paper was published. This was research done in mice, but we think that, that, that there are some similarities between the nervous system of mice and humans, and that's why so much research, medical research gets done in mice. It, but it turns out that there are one type of neuron in the brain that actually have a profound effect on anxiety, depression, and overeating. One type of neuron. And, and when, we'll tell you what that neuron is when we come back after this break. <laughs> okay, no, 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 continue on. Sorry, I just, I just, you know, it goes back to my old TV, like leave them hanging. Leave them hanging. <laughs> Interesting. I, okay. So I'm not going to go into like the site because uh, that's way over most people's heads, including a little bit mine. But the, the, the main point is there's one neuron that's been identified that affects all of these. So when that neuron is not functioning properly, and that's the thing these researchers study, when that neuron is not functioning properly, what happens is that Keep the, the mice be, showed symptoms or signs of anxiety, depression, and what else? Overeating. And when they manipulated the function of this neuron very specifically, this just this one neuron, they could make the mice not depressed, not anxious, and lose weight, or they could make the mice depressed, anxious, and gaining weight. So again, these systems, so in that case, it's not even the system is highly interconnected. The system is one in the same. One set of neurons is controlling your mood, your anxiety level, and your eating behavior. And now by no means is all human emotion, anxiety, depression, and all eating behavior controlled by one set of neurons. It's not. It, this is one part of a very complicated puzzle. Um, there are lots of things that regulate mood, that regulate feeding behavior. But again, these researchers could have profound effects on mood, anxiety, and eating behaviors by manipulating just one type of neuron. And so, you know, so how do you break that cycle? Well, these researchers were looking at drugs that might be <laughs> might be used. So stay tuned for that. Maybe in 20, 30 years, we'll have something new on the block. Was was the research uh, sponsored perhaps by some pharmaceutical company? It, I, I actually, that's a good question. I didn't, I didn't 
do a deep dive on that because because as I was reading the research, I'm like, I don't need drugs for this. I can do an intervention right now by changing people's eating behavior. And again, I think that's part of this crash that I talk about or this keto flu that I talk about. It's why people feel profoundly ill when they first start the intervention because your biology is telling you eat more, eat more. You're depressed, you're anxious, so eat more. That's what your brain is trying to tell you to do and trying to get you to do. And so most of us just give in to that. And, um, and we roll with it because it feels very comfortable and it feels almost natural, intuitive. And to resist it seems like I, I can't resist my gut instinct. I can't resist my biology. Literally a gut oh, instinct. Yes. It, yes. It, you know, last night. Okay, so I've been trying my hardest because I've had a really bad habit lately, especially uh, of of eating, you know, at bedtime and, you know, even bringing something in into bed with me to 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 snack on. And so I've been trying to resist that. But last night it was just so overwhelming and I knew I wasn't hungry, I, you know, in, in, you know, in a biological sense, but I couldn't resist it. Is there a trick then to really listening to having your, your, your gut and your brain actually listen to each other and understand each other. So the, the way that I usually work with people to do this. And so a lot of people, you know, listen to me, even people who've never struggled with, um, a mental health issue at all, listen to me. And they're like, how, you know, Oh, you've probably been genetically gifted. You're one of those lucky people who has good genes and you've never struggled with your weight. You never have to do this. So shut up. We don't want to listen to you. Um, the, the reality is I have a very strong family history of both metabolic disorders and mental illness. Um, I've had my own struggles with mental illness when I was younger and I had metabolic syndrome when I was in my twenties. And I know all too well about comfort eating at night, sitting on the sofa, just eating and falling asleep and waking up and, you know, whatever, and, and trying to get to bed and pushing the snooze button and feeling not so great in the morning. I know all about that. And, um, but I changed that for myself, you know, well over 20 years ago. And, um, and it, so it, I kind of feel like if I can do it, other people can do it. Um, I'm not that special. I'm really not. And uh, so th the model that I use really is more of an addiction model. And um, not, you know, there's, a, there's kind of a political kind of very controversial issue about like, is sugar addictive? Are processed foods addictive? And there are very serious researchers on both sides of that kind of uh, argument. Um, the, the, the most prominent proponent of that argument is actually a woman named Nora Volkov, who's a, a prominent researcher. She's the head of the National Institute of Drug Abuse in the United States. And uh, she actually showed through a lot of research of her own that uh, highly processed High sugar foods are in fact addictive and they hijack or they use the same addiction reward pathways that cocaine, cocaine. uses, that methamphetamine uses, everything else. And she is pretty convinced that, yes, these foods are addictive. Um, now, other people disagree. And of course, the food industry doesn't want to think of their products as addictive. But, um, but I kind of use the same tools that we use in addiction treatment to help people overcome these bad habits. So the first step is just like an addiction. The first step is to recognize I have a problem and this might be contributing to some of the adversity that I have in life. It might be contributing to my bad mood. It might be contributing to my type two diabetes and I'm kind of on a downward spiral and I don't want to stay on this downward spiral. I want, I can. And so kind of recognition and acknowledgement is the first step. 
And then the next step is to come up with a plan. And, um, and, and then you have to really start to get very specific. Just like somebody who's an alcoholic, who's trying to give up alcohol, they have their tempting situations. They have the stresses in life that are going to drive them or tempt them to drink. They have people in their life that are drinking buddies. They're, oh, come on. You got it. Yo, just one. Come on. Oh, come on. You can drink. Yo, come on. Yo. The family get togethers, all of those situations. And if you're really going to help somebody give up alcohol who has a problem with alcohol use, you really have to get very granular in that way on all of these different situations. There's not a, there's not a one sentence, here's the advice for how to give up alcohol. There you go, problem solved. It, you have to get really granular and you have to think through, well, what, what are all of the situations that are gonna tempt you? And now let's come up with what could you do instead? So that one example you gave, I climbed into bed last night, I kind of recognized a part of me recognized this probably isn't good for me. I'm not even hungry. Why am I taking food to bed with me? But yet here I am, I'm climbing into bed with my food and I'm gonna eat it. And so I would say, I would want you to use the same strategies that I would want an alcoholic to use when they have a lapse or a relapse. So what, what drove you to do that? And much more importantly, what could you have done instead? Or what will you do next time instead? How will you resist that trap? So food, for better or worse, just like alcohol, food is a reward. And we all reward ourselves with food. People who are eating healthy diets, it is a it is a brain instinct. We require food to live. Our brains are hardwired to reward us when we eat things that satisfy us. And um, but but there's obviously a degree, and and there are different types of food. So for a lot of people who are addicted or who are eating highly processed highly palatable foods. They're eating cookies and candy and chips and all sorts of things, very high calorie foods. For most of those people, it can be hard for them to eat fruits and vegetables because fruits and vegetables are so bland and tasteless. Um, and uh, and it, it really is because their reward pathways in their brain are so flooded with these highly rewarding foods that in comparison, an apple or celery sticks or something like that, those mean nothing to the brain. Um, and so part of it is rewiring and retraining those brain circuits. And, and the, the cold hard reality is that you have to go through a detox, just like an alcoholic has to go through mm -hmm. a detox. And that is gonna be brutal and painful and not pleasant. People who want to get on this other side of the equation using a dietary intervention, I usually let them know, you've got to think of it as a detox. It's not about making one or two small changes in your diet. Like eat an apple a day and that'll, that'll be a start to a healthier life. Well, you know what? If you're eating lots of chips and candy and baked goods and stuff along with that apple a day, it's not going to do anything. It's like telling the alcoholic, you know, just just cut back by a half a drink um, or, you know, or eat an apple a day in addition to all that you're drinking, like eating an apple a day should be good for you. Well, no, if, if, if they're poisoning their body and their brain with high levels of alcohol, eating an apple a day is not really going to do much at all. And um, so I usually let people know it's going to be like a detox and it's not going to be pleasant. It's amazing how many of my patients can get through that when they are given accurate information? So again, I don't sugarcoat it. I let them know this is going to be really hard because if I send an alcoholic to a detox and said, this is going to be easy, <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just go to a detox. You're going to feel so great. It's going to be awesome. They, they, 
they would quickly drop out of treatment within a day or two because they would be like, this is clearly not going the way Dr. Palmer said it was going to go. This is brutal. Something's wrong. Something is wrong. I'm not feeling good right now. I am really in pain and suffering. And so something clearly is horribly wrong. So I'm stopping this treatment. When I prescribe dietary interventions, I feel like people need the same accurate advice. Expect a brutal experience, but you can be tough. You can get through it. We'll plan for it. I'm here to support you. We'll bring in other supports. If you've got friends, family, others who will support you through this, let's bring them on board. Let's do an intervention. The really good news is with dietary interventions is that it usually at about six weeks, I usually tell people, give it at least six weeks, no matter how awful it feels, no matter how much you think I can't do this, I, this is not sustainable for me. I cannot keep giving up this food. When people get through the six week mark, that's when they come out the other side and they're like, oh my God, my friend is eating a donut right in front of me and I would have never been able to resist that. But right now I feel so, I have felt so good over the last few weeks and I'm not craving that donut anymore. Like I, I can live without that donut actually. And my life is so much better because my brain is firing on all cylinders and I feel good and I woke up really feeling great this morning. And now invariably people will cheat. And usually that's, that's the thing that gets them hooked or not. When they cheat, they usually feel not good at all. And they wake up with a hangover they notice that depression starting to come back. They feel mm -hmm. fatigued again. And that is the critical moment for most people. They either recognize, oh my gosh, eating what I just ate last night is not worth feeling this way. I can't go through life feeling this way just so I can have pizza. Like it, pizza's not worth it. Pizza, the pizza was good. It tasted okay, but it wasn't worth ruining my whole day over. Um, or they give in. They, you know, they're in an environment where nobody is supporting them. They're, they're, they've gone on vacation and everybody's on a bender, so to speak, with food and booze and everything else. And they're going on the bender as well and then they never get back on the train. And again, it, the analogy with recovery from a substance use disorder is so similar. It, um, same thing can happen with people. If you're an alcoholic and you give it up and are successful, a lot of people I talk to are like, I would never go back. I would never go back to that life. I'm just so much happier and so much better, less drama less everything off of the alcohol. I don't need it anymore. I don't want it anymore. And yet others struggle for years or decades to try to quit and they just can't seem to do it. And it, it does seem to be a combination of biological factors, social factors, psychological factors, they all matter. And, um, you know, so I'm a big fan of people working with clinicians when they need to, to try to figure this stuff out. And we come full circle uh, here and, and we find that everything we are, do, feel is all interconnected and, and there's no separation for that. I want, Doctor, I want to thank you, um, not just for this time, uh, this, this has been wonderful. I want to thank you for a couple of things. First of all, I, you know, I think in the 60s and 70s, we developed an arrogance when it came to mental health that we knew it all and that we knew the answer was simply a mixture of therapy and drugs and and there it is it it's just now that we're really starting to open up once again and say listen we don't know it all and we better start looking for other answers so for that i thank you for for, for doing that research but you know what i think what i thank you for most is your passion and your positivity because in reading your articles and talking to you now it it provides hope and, and i think that that is probably what is in shortest supply right now and what is in most demand and that is hope so i want to thank you for that and of course thank you for this conversation 
Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm so I, that is uh, heartwarming to hear. And to me, that is like one of the greatest compliments because that is what I am passionate about is trying to give people hope, um, but not false hope either. Mm-hmm. Not just pie in the sky. I, I want real solutions. I want to actually improve people's lives, to decrease their suffering, to help them live better, happier, content lives. So, uh, yeah. Incredible closing words. Thank you. Thanks. Remember, as with anything you do for your health, there is no magic list of five foods that will change your life. This will be work, but I promise you it will be worth it. Next episode, we often look at younger generations as being more resilient, maybe even immune to depression, but the numbers tell us this is very wrong. I tried everything, uh, telling my professors that I was struggling and letters to counselors, but nothing was done. You know, I just felt really hopeless. And at the time, I felt that taking my life was the best option. Depression and youth next time on the happy molecule don't forget join me for the happy molecule extra live on the kevin frankish facebook and twitter pages and on my youtube channel sunday night 7 p.m eastern until next time take care of yourself and take care of each other please consider subscribing to this podcast and also check out the happy molecule extra at thehappymolecule.com. There you'll find a link to a video version of this episode. Be able to join the conversation about mental health, learn about our Facebook Live show, and get a preview of upcoming episodes. You can email us at thehappymolecule at gmail.com. I'm Erin Davis, wishing you good mental health.